kind of a monster are you? Bone cruncher. Child chewer. Meat dripper. Gizzard gulper. Butcher boy. Hi, I'm Jane Thorpe. You're watching The Fan Carpet. I'm here with Jonathan Holmes, who plays the child chewer in the BFG by Steven Spielberg. Jonathan, thank you so much for being here. I saw the film last night and wow. Um, I know as an interviewer I'm meant to gush, but I'm, I'm being honest and genuine. I loved it. It was amazing. What were you working with? Were you just given direction of like, well, uh, um, did you have any of the environment to go with or was it, we did this all green screen stuff? Worked for uh, three weeks or three or four weeks before we went to camera um, just to try and create these characters, find the physicality. Uh, and so we worked with a guy called Terry Notary who uh, been one of the pioneers uh, from the acting perspective of motion capture, performance capture stuff. So he helped us uh, with the kind of technical aspects of performance. And in terms of creating the character, where did the character for you come from? Was it something you'd had in reserve or did you draw on certain things? Well, the, the characters in the novel, in the book, are fairly loosely drawn. Uh, so they're just this kind of collective mass. Uh, and so we were given quite a lot of latitude to really create uh, layers within that and so my giant and we all worked together the nine of us and we would well we spent hours improvising stuff and and we worked a lot with Melissa Matheson who uh, wrote E.T. Yeah. Uh, and she was brilliant and really really sadly she passed away a few months after we'd um, finished shooting but uh, she uh, she was with us the whole time. So she was with us when we were uh, rehearsing and improvising stuff, and she would give us suggestions about what she felt these giants might uh, be like. And she was really open to uh, any suggestions that we had as well. So it was it, it it was great. I think from a viewer's perspective, I felt that she genuinely understood the film. It's it's rare to say that the book um, and the screenplay married up and it's normally in the case of uh, the, the film wasn't as good as the book mm -hmm. but it it, it just it, the, the inner child in me was doing cartwheels that's the only way I was explaining it because that, that was that was how I saw the film the, the mental images in my head when I was younger so obviously you were working with Spielberg what was that like it was fantastic he yeah. was the loveliest man he was uh, enormously gracious mm. uh, very keen to put you at ease mm. Because I think he's acutely aware of, 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 you know, his sort of iconic position within the industry. And he wants you to be comfortable because he can't get the best work out of you if you're starstruck. So when I first met him, uh, he was introduced to a couple of us. And, uh, and he said, you know, this is going to be a learning experience for both of us. And I was thinking, <laughs> actually, probably a little more for me than you, but that's very kind. So he really put you at ease. Uh, he was um, very collaborative. He was happy to listen to whatever you brought in. And I think, uh, you know, he was the most energetic uh, guy on set. He was like, a, you know, a kid in a candy store. He, he loves what he does. And he's passionate about making the best movie that he can make and telling the story that he wants to tell. So it was enormously heartening to see that. Talking of um, putting your ease and getting the best from you, you were telling me a story earlier about how um, he encouraged your giant voice, shall we say. Are you happy to share that now? Yeah, so we were, we were working on uh, not just the physicality mm. of these giants, but the voices as well. Uh, and actually, in the, in, in, the, in the final cut of the movie, the giants are more just a, uh, a sort of uh, collection of grunts and noises. And, but, but initially, there was, there was, there was scary, a lot more... Though. Yeah. still scary mm. uh, and I remember uh, the first time that he heard my particular giant voice he's like I can't understand a word you're saying I can't understand you like it's great I love it but I, I can't you understand could, a word you you're saying. You've got to share it with us now. I mean, just, just, well, you know, yeah. it was a bit, I saw it a bit like this, and I went sort of northern giant. I thought it might be a bit scary. <laughs> but he was like, I don't understand what that is. I don't know what you're doing but I can't understand it. <laughs> Whereas everyone up north is going, that would, yeah, yeah, that's, that's absolutely, brilliant. yes, yeah. brilliant. <laughs> I think it's from somewhere outside Berry, isn't he? I'm not sure, <laughs> Preston perhaps. But, uh, yeah, but, uh, yeah. 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 So, so there's, and you know, and you build yourself up and you think, oh, he's gonna love this, he's gonna love it. And then, no, I can't understand you. So what did you dilute it down to then? Well, it, it just had a, a little bit of essence mm. of that. And, uh, and then a lot of the guys moved towards 
you know, more sort of uh, London sounds, which is, uh, you know, a bit easier on the ear for yeah. a global audience because they kind of get that a little bit more. So a lot of us moved a bit towards that. Still deeply menacing. As yes, well. of course, of course. Exactly. <laughs> How is it working with Mark, Mark Rylance? Great. Yeah. Again, couldn't have been lovelier. Uh, and for somebody, you know, I sort of started out on the stage mm. in the UK, and and for somebody, and he's a, you know two or three years older than me, and you know he's he's a sublime talent. You know, he's a kind of one of these kind of transcendent talent. So to actually work with him was was brilliant. Mm. And you know, he's just another actor. You know, yeah. I don't want to make it sound like he's this yeah, but, but so to to work as, you know, equals in a mm. sense on this thing was was brilliant. And he was he was threw himself in with great enthusiasm. It's in, it's inspirational being around people with uh, talent like that, isn't it? it really and is. um watching the film, I was I was inspired by Ruby, little Ruby. She's yeah. such a confident little actress. She's fantastic. Yeah, yeah Ruby Barnhill. She mm. is and again, I mean, what was amazing was the, just the way she managed to, to, to take it in her stride because mm. it's a huge deal. You know, being, playing the lead in a massive, you know, Spielberg undertaking she like this. Like she was born to it, and she was, yeah. she was great. I mean, she's got a really brilliant family. Her dad's actually in the film as oh, well. Really? Paul, yeah. He plays one of the, the footmen okay. in, uh, in the Buckingham Palace scenes. Uh, one of the ones that was so he's, he's the ones. He's one of the ones that, that when, he, when the BFG uh, comes into Buckingham Palace, yeah. he's going, up to the port, to the left, up to the right. I love that that's, one. That's that Ruby's was, that dad. One of the biggest laughs in, yeah. in the, uh, the theatre. Yeah, that that's, that's Ruby's dad. Yeah. And uh, and so they're they're a really lovely family, and they were obviously all the, the whole family were there for, um, for the bulk, for for all the shoes, and uh, and it was yeah. So she's she comes from good stock. I can I can tell. Do you have any special memories from your time filming it? Those firsts, really, those first time of actually seeing uh, the the space that we were working in, because mm -hmm. it was it was shot just outside Vancouver. And Near your home. Yeah, exactly. It's a handy. I was Twenty minutes from. Home. Well designed. It was and it, you know the sheer scale mm. of of this operation was uh, was something amazing mm. because they uh, the, the the animators were a company called Weta, who was Peter Jackson's company, who did Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit and all those guys. So there are banks and banks and banks of animators behind um, computer screens, as well as you know everything that comes with a with a, a movie set that big. So just walking onto that and thinking. All right. <laughs> I'm glad I went I'd to that better, audition. <laughs> I'd better be good then. Uh, so that I certainly remember that. In terms of going to auditions and things, um, is this all part of a career trajectory to you, or is it more loose? How do you choose your roles? I choose my roles by what I get offered. <laughs> you know, I, I wish I could say that I was I was in a place where I could. Uh, you know, where I had a pile of scripts on my agent's desk and I was picking and choosing what I could do. But, you know, for most of us in this industry, that's not the case. I've been fortunate that I've worked consistently and I, you know, I've earned a living doing this. And that, to me, is, is, is the goal, is to keep on working. So uh, I don't really think in terms of, I probably should think in terms of career, but I don't. I, you know, it really is just a collection of gigs. And then at some point, it would be great to look back and go, well, that was a career, sort of. You know? <laughs> Cobbled it together yeah, nicely. Yeah, well really, done, mate. You know, really yeah. I'm fortunate enough that I, 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 I do quite a bit of theatre. Um, I do quite a bit of voiceover. Um, so I, I, you know, I, I work in various different aspects of the industry. So it's actually, uh, you know, it, it's, it's nice from that perspective that I can get work from, from various corners of this crazy business. What would be your ideal role if you could design something? You know what, and this is, uh, I should probably be a bit more ambitious than this, but my ideal role would be in uh, like a, a long running, <laughs> uh, sort of episodic, really good show, and you have a great recurring character. Mm -hmm. So you have like two or three days an episode, you haven't got pages and pages and pages and pages of stuff, okay. you haven't got the pressure of carrying an entire show. Mm -hmm. But you have, you know, but it's something that you can really grow with doing, you know, and and and, and there's it, quite it, a few of those over in America. You, pays quite that. well, yeah. and also to get, you know, to do some 
some more theatre as well to really keep in touch with with that world as well. What about um, your role on stage then? What would be an ideal role on stage for you? I've always wanted to do, and I might be a bit long in the tooth now, uh, Richard II. No. Yes, no, no, no. I'm 50. No, no, no. Yes, I am. <laughs> uh, Actors shouldn't declare their age. Well, I am. I'm 50 years old. But you uh, can play the side. Yeah, and yeah. I, but Richard II and was we always some... And about you being a character actor as well, yes. which is, it's different. For but Richard II isn't 50. Okay, that's fair all. enough. <laughs> but I always quite like that. Um, so but, you nice know, that, I always wanted to play that. But, I mean, the last, I just did a five-month uh, theatre gig here in the UK mm-hmm. at the Bristol Old Vic in Liverpool, Everyman, and, and we were doing a version of uh, Madame Bovary, the novel, and I played... I think 16 characters in wow. that. And so that was, and I had about 50 costume changes within the space of two and a half hours. Yeah. So that was actually brilliant because yeah. it allowed me to, uh, um, you know, run the gamut. Are these things, do you think, aspiring actors think of? Because I think um, I've got friends that are aspiring actors and they, they're. They focus on the technicality, the technical bits of the lines, and and pulling the character outside of them. But we, we, you've obviously talked about the the sets and the films today, and mm-hmm. you're talking about being on stage there. It, it seems to be me to me that when you're an actor, there's so much more involved. What would you say to an aspiring actor? What would you say? certainly as far as film, because I didn't come to film and television until I was a little bit older. I was sort of in my 30s really before I started oh doing much film and TV. And the hardest thing. I had to get used to was simply the environment Mm. of film and television. And you know, I've often said that if you you could design an environment that was less conducive to to acting than I'd like, than than a film set, then I'd like to see one. So really it's a matter of getting used to that environment uh, and and being able to to focus and being able to do your work. And it takes a while to do that. Um, So really it's, it's kind of acclimatizing to that weird, ridiculous setup mm. uh, and and just do your work you know just just don't get too tied up with a lot of the other stuff just just focus on being in the moment and doing your work and loving it I guess yeah, yeah. I mean god you got you got to keep because there are going to be times when you know every actor goes through times when it's just hard and you question why you're doing it and you question why you didn't do something else and so if you don't still have that love for what you do that that that's when you 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 go and do something else which is fine if that's what you want to do but if you keep doing it you've got to hold on to that 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 passion of why you got into it in the first place did you always want to be an actor I think I did really I don't know if it was necessarily a conscious thing but I I I I always performed Um, I was a little I sang as a little boy uh, performed in school plays, and it was always very much a part of what I did. Uh, and then, you know, went on to study it when I left school and university, and then went on to postgraduate after that, and then you just end up doing it. So I don't know whether it was something that I was, you know, said, this is what I'm going to do, but it, it just kind of evolved into what I did. And what do you have coming up next? I've got a couple of things which I can't tell you about. Oh, no! Because, like, everything these days, you... Not even little hints, tiny oh, well, hints. I'm doing uh, an animation series okay. uh, that's that's based on a, a movie. Mm-hmm. That's, that's much <laughs> I can tell you. Uh, and then I'm is doing. It's small. Is it? Uh, it's, it's big. It's big. Yeah. Yeah. That's enough. Yeah. yeah. Um, and you know, and and apart from that, I'm just getting back out there and auditioning again. Fantastic. I have a quick favour to ask for you. Yes. I would love you to do a nursery rhyme in your giant voice, of as course. we didn't get to hear that yes. much of it um, yes. in the film. Pick a nursery rhyme, pluck it out of thin air. Mary had a little lamb. Her fleece was white as snow. And everywhere that Mary went, the lamb was sure to go. <laughs> That is actually quite menacing. Thank you. <laughs> a lot, a lot of the, a lot of that. If you were the sizes and mounting as well on top of that, that would that would be quite uh, quite alarming to say the least. Jonathan, thank you so much. It's been a delight talking to you. So the BFG is out now and it's perfect family fun. I'm Jane Thorpe. You've been watching the Fan Carpet. You can find us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram for all the upcoming film news and new releases. Thank you so much for watching. Times will be hard, times will be soft. 
So hold your breaths, cross your fingers, here we go. I'm going to call you BFG.